dance for joy or lust or anger. So welcome to uh, Sensible Second Hand Classics, a series where we take a look at uh, practical cars from yesteryear that are over 15 years old that you can buy for between one and five thousand pounds. This is a 1979 Chrysler Avenger 1600 GL. And yes, it is the one that Steph and my driver classic drove at the Great British Car Journey. In fact, here we are at the Great British Car Journey, where I've been waiting to drive this car for a very, very long time. Ever since I knew they had this car, I've been wanting to have a go in it. And I am not disappointed. Compared with other cars we've driven, like the Morris Marina and uh, the Vauxhall V that would have competed directly against this, this Avenger in its various guises throughout the 1970s, it feels absolutely fantastic. It's got a lovely gearbox. The engine doesn't feel like it's kind of constantly struggling all the time. Um, the engine, d d you know, dread specifically for this car when it was launched in 1970 and um, the, the steering is a delight it's really accurate the car's not rolling very much in the corners particularly in comparison to the Vauxhall Viva and it's pulling really nicely as well it's it's not the old Simca Poissy engine which was used in things like the Horizon and um, the Alpine it's a Roots' own unit when they were kind of half owned by Chrysler and then fully owned by Chrysler by 1967 so they did a lot of development work on this car before they were fully um, actually owned by them but they were financed by them of course so going through this slalom is nice and easy got to be a bit quick with the steering there we go but it's okay it's quite light actually no power assistance or anything like that brake serve course all synchro mesh gearbox the original Avenger engine range was a 1250cc in a 1500, developing um, 58 and then 63 brake horsepower for the 1500. In 1973, the engines were upgraded to 1.3, 1.6 litres. Now, with the 1.3, I've seen different power outputs for this um, of between 49 and 58 horsepower, but why on earth you, you'd enlarge the engine to have less power? I, I really, really don't know. The 1.6 uh, developed um, 80 horsepower. This was certainly this is, feels like it with this one. There was also a GT version um, of both the 1.5 initially um, that was later rebadged for GLS and made a bit fancier. That had 77 horsepower. And then the GT later on became a 1300 model and it had 69 horsepower. Most powerful Avenger of all was, of course, the Tiger. There was a Tiger 1 and a Tiger 2. They were made, I think, 72, 73. And uh, that had anywhere between like 90 and sort of um, 104 horsepower. I've seen both of those, but the most reliable figure I've seen is about 100 horsepower. The trim levels available for one of these were the Deluxe. There was also just a base Avenger as well. Um, and then there was a, 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 a Super. Oh, very close to cutting that cone there. Um, the GL, the GTO GLS, and then later on with the Chrysler, which uh, came out in 76, there was the uh, LS, the GL, and the GLS. This is the mid range GL. One thing I would say is that the clutch is a little bit weird in this car, that's why I've been struggling with the um, setting the right gear a little bit. I think we'll put that choke in as well. But overall, in comparison with all the other stuff, the, the marina isn't really as bad as uh, a lot of people will tell you it is. It's actually not that, not that bad. It's not the best, but out of all three of them, and um, I have to get to drive a Mark II Escort, so I can't really tell you with any authority, but this feels like this would be my favourite out of all of them.
I've heard many people criticise the styling of the Chrysler and the Talbot Avengers um, in comparison with the older ones, but I think this looks quite nice. I think the styling does make it look more uh, contemporary than it otherwise would have done when this facelifted model was introduced in 1976. Strangely, these cars actually kept the, the Pentastar at the front because Chrysler retained the rights to make uh, the um, Avenger until 1990 when it was discontinued in South America. So a very long production run for this design, which started in 1970. From August 1979, it would have been a, a Talbot logo there rather than a Chrysler. This is a late Chrysler model from early 79. I know that Steph, my driver classic, very much enjoyed driving this car when she came to the museum in 2021, along with the Imp. But I've actually been looking forward to this for a really, really long time. I've wanted to get an Avenger on my channel for ages, and it's just a delight to see one in this sort of condition. The uh, really weird thing is, <laughs> oh no, oh, this horrendous decision that, that Chrysler made to not even give the car new rear wing pressings for the face of the 76, but just put these silly caps on. And it looks, it looks appalling. It looks awful. Wow, that's bad. Um, I mean, the rear lights themselves aren't too bad. I mean, you can see next to this Viva, it's sort of fashion for rear lights a bit like that. But if they just redone these pressings, it would have been a little bit better. Maybe why people complain about it so much. So the Hillmans probably look from the back a lot better with the hockey stick rear lights. So we'll um, have a look in a bit, a little bit later. Let's have a sit in the front. So it's a very similar dashboard to the Alpine that was also introduced in 1976. With this GL model, the sort of middle um, one that you could get at this time, there is a rev counter, which is fantastic. This even looks very similar to the dashboard in a sort of top of the horizon or something like that. So we've got hazard lights just there. Ooh, it's a nice noise as well. I think that's uh, probably brake fluid level check. Like a lot of the sort of Renaults of an early 80s. Um, we've got a motor roller long wave radio in here. There are the heater controls, the fan speed's just there. Clock in there, that's actually not accurate. And then um, chuck lever down there. And the spindliest, spindliest indicator stalks known to man, which actually work with the ignition off. Yeah, that's off. That's really, really strange. Um, so yeah, so here, which is rear window, fog light switch there. It's a set of reasonably contemporary dashboard for the time. And very, very weird door pockets. Very weird. Someone's put some speakers in here at some point, maybe in the 1980s, I think. Driving position in this, it, it, it's quite good for a car like this. I mean, the, the steering with anything is just right in front of you. The, the, the pedals are not off to one side like they were on a lot of cars. For example, an Imp is off to one side, uh, ADO 16s like that. Um, this isn't. Is that an ashtray? Yes, it is. And a cigarette lighter. It's very posh, isn't it? Very, very posh. I think that's the original speaker for the, for the radio. It's not a surprise that someone who um, uh, owned this car in the 80s would have put some better speakers in it. If you think the video that I'm doing is terrible, then, well, why don't you come along to Great British Car Journey and uh, see if you can do a better job, because you can drive this very car and you can film yourself doing it, so you can improve on my video. But it releases on the left-hand side for some weird reason, because the Avenger was, um, by this stage anyway, in 79, it was very much a car that was popular, really, in, in the UK um, and not many other countries in Europe. Probably says electronique there because we're in, uh, well, the era when actually uh, Peugeot owned um, the uh, the company. They bought it in 1978 for $1 because Chrysler Europe was so bad. Bit of a mess really, but never mind. So we might go around actually to the other side. Fuel filler is actually on the side of the car rather than at the back on the, as in on the original Hillman Avengers. I won't sing, by the way, the 1979 song from Tim Hart um, about the Hillman Avenger because 
I might get a copyright strike and you might have your ears bleed. Ooh, very nice. We've got the most violent ashtray in the world. Very nice sort of velour seating here. Let's see what sort of space this is. Bear in mind this was really a rival to something like a Mark II Escort at this time, or one of those HC Vivas. That's pretty good. There's a fair bit of room in here, actually. Um, you've got, you know, you've got to have your knees quite upright, but there's a lot of give in the seat. It's very sort of soft and very kind of French. I wonder if, uh, you know, there's some sort of French design um, in this interior from, you know, the Chrysler Alpine or something like that. That's pretty good. You even get an ash on the other side, too. I wonder what the GLS had over um, one of these. One thing I do like... <laughs> oh, yes! A clunk clip seatbelt comfort control that uh, when I was younger my childminder had in her 1984 Mark II Volkswagen Polo. Right, let's uh, get those keys and uh, take a look in the boot. So yeah, quite a big boot for a car like this, although like an old Proton, losing things down the side um, is quite easy. I don't really want to put my hand down there, it would be, be, be a bit icky probably. Someone's had a go at some wiring back here as well, probably for those speakers. The load lip's quite high though, I mean that's a problem that you know the Viva also, also has and lots of cars of the time would have, but uh, you know it's something to sort of point out really. But yeah, if you wanted even more capacity you could just buy an estate. Or at this time Chrysler Europe were also marketing the Sunbeam which was basically like a three door version of the Avenger with a new body and the same 1.3 and 1.6 engines along with a little 928cc engine which is a development of the Imp engine so if you wanted that and it has the same sort of thing as the Imp with the sort of um, glass hatch at the back um, then you could have it or you could just go for the traditional Avenger which um, up until 1981 when they finally stopped selling it in this country uh oh uh, we're going to have to do something about that. Um, when I finally stopped selling it in this country, it was still selling quite well, and they actually had to shut the entire factory up in Scotland where it was being made at the time, which is a bit of a shame. Right, let's have a look at the engine and see if we can sort out this, uh, this boot. So this is the uh, 1.6 litre overhead valve engine, although the um, push rods are very, very short in this engine, in this case developing about 80 horsepower. I presume you could probably try to fit like a larger engine in here or something like that. And of course the um, Sunbeam which uses this, this platform had a 2.2 litre version in the uh, Sunbeam Lotus. But yes, remarkable condition for something from 1979 that's made in Britain. As you can see very much cries the United Kingdom Limited it says there. Edges uh, range from about sort of uh, 1250cc all the way up to the 1600. Probably interesting uh, radiate fog lamps at the bottom there. It's reasonably easy to work on, longitudinally mounted. I mean, one of the things that I think Roots are trying to do with the, the Avenger was make it quite simple and conventional, and it certainly is. It's, it's not particularly complicated. Uh, I don't know how strong these engines are, but yes. All very pleasing. Lloyd Living Consulting stickers, t-shirts and mugs are available by clicking the link to the Google form in the video description below. One thing I would like to drive at some point in my life is a Chrysler Sunbeam to be able to uh, tell you you know what those are actually like as Petula Clark said put a Chrysler Sunbeam in your life but those are probably even rarer than the Avengers these days the car was um, badged in this myriad different variants rather like the Hillman Imp all over the world and actually Volkswagen I think kept this car in production for some reason they owned this sort of South American arm of Chrysler by that stage I don't really know why we um, kept it going until 
Let's have a look now at some of the derivatives of the Avenger around the world. So there was the uh, Sunbeam Avenger, the Dodge Avenger, the Plymouth Cricket, which was in the United States of America. That didn't go very well. Um, the rust problems on these cars, like so many other things in the 70s, were pretty bad. And um, that and sort of quality issues um, from Roots' uh, plants which are frequently on strike. It uh, didn't endear them, particularly to the American buying public, so it only lasted 73. The Dodge 1800 later uh, on, this car received an upgrade to 1.8 litres. Um, I think it was in South America. The Dodge Polara for some reason. Confusing. Um, the Dodge 1500, the Volkswagen 1500, and the Sunbeam 1500. There were factories for these cars in uh, Brazil, Iran, Colombia, Argentina, and New Zealand. I've also heard that the South African versions of these cars um, used a Peugeot 1.6 engine. Um, I presume that was from the days when um, Peugeot sort of owned uh, Chrysler Europe, or maybe it wasn't, I don't know. Maybe somebody in the comment section below can explain that to me. So viewers, should you uh, buy an Avenger um, for your hard-earned budget to between one and five thousand pounds and since what's second hand classic? Um, well, it depends if you can find one, I suppose. Um, a lot of people seem to prefer the earlier ones. They have a completely different dashboard in them, different front end, different rear end. Even the fuel fill is in a different place. Uh, yeah, if you could find one, one like this that's um, got no rust on it and is running well, unless you decide to, uh, you know, mess up the gear changes, which is what I did. Um, but I don't see why not. I very much enjoyed this car. I knew I, knew I would. But it's good to see that my um, sort of preconceptions have been confirmed. Anyway, thank you ever so much indeed once again for watching this episode of Sensible Second Hand Classics. Please don't forget to subscribe to the channel, like this video, leave a comment below. And thank you once again to Great British Car Journey for letting me have a go in this car. Thank you again.